I've eaten. Oops.
Hello. Madeline? Yes, here I am. Hello, Joe. Hi, I just made you, you a co-host. Yeah, there we are. Great. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. I know it's, it's a busy, busy time of year, so it's nice to finally talk to you face to face. <laughs> Likewise. So if, have we not invited people in yet? Uh, we've got uh, about 17 people here. Okay. So you've already opened the room up? Yes. Yeah. We're open right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's coming in. So now, Joe, did you want to um, screen share? I'm going to screen you want share. To get yeah. started first? Um, I'm just going to work on my tech here in the back and just make sure I close down my um, email and um, other things before we begin. Sure. But yes, yeah. I, have a, I have a slide. I have a, a slide presentation. I have about 40 slides or so um, that I think will spark okay. some some good discussion okay great great yeah it's something it's a topic that people have been asking about so i think it's just it's really timely um and uh, i probably um wrote to you that these these monday night webinars are, have kind of been um, a regular thing for well since covid started mm. <clears throat> and um yeah so we've done a lot of different topics and uh, this is one that we've never really addressed like um, um, head on. So, so that's great. Now, where are you? Are you in California? No, I'm in New York City. <laughs> oh, you're in, oh, okay. Why did I think you were on the West Coast? I don't know. I'm, I'm oh. definitely an East Coast kind of guy. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. Oh, okay. So it's nine o'clock for you. It's nine o'clock, yeah. Oh, I I really appreciate that. That's okay. I'm uh, sorry. Usually, if people are EST, I kind of offer to do it a little bit earlier. That's think. okay. No worries. Oh, it's good to change up your your routine once in a while, you know. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> for sure. I just want to see if uh, Mark Lawrence is coming on. So usually before we start, Mark, we'll just uh, welcome you from the pain clinic, uh, Bill Nelms Pain and Research Center, and then and then we'll dive in. Okay, great. Yeah. You can hear me okay and, and everything? I can hear you great. Yeah. And I see for the people that are here, can you hear us okay? How's the sound? All good. Good. Okay, great. Perfect. Yes. And as everyone knows, as always, we are being recorded. So um, the webinar, don't feel like you have to take notes and take everything down because uh, it will be posted. Uh, the recording will go up on the website. Um, after. All right. Hmm. So I see your connection is red there. Is that you or is that me? Is red? Yeah, I can see your little, um, your status, the bars there were red for a second. I might change my internet connection here, hold on. Sure. Seems okay for now, right? I'm not freezing or anything. I don't know if, if my video is gonna be on or just the slides. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you're not freezing at all. Okay. So it, it's all it's all looking pretty good and sounds good. Um, yeah, so we've got about two minutes. Mark's here. Maybe what I'll do is just stop <coughs> the share. And as everybody's gathering, uh, Paul says Joe sounds a bit low. Hmm. Okay, we'll see how that goes. Great. Hello, everyone. 
Okay, well, um, as everyone knows, on uh, these Monday night um, Zoom calls, you can um, uh, uh, you can participate through the chat box, which is the little chat bubble, and um, and then just write any comments. I'll try to uh, keep an eye on the chat as uh, as we're going through. Don't worry about taking in all the information. As, as I said, it's going to be it's, uh, the recording will be up on the website. So um, we will get going with tonight's guest. So I'm really excited. It's one of those ones when I get a confirmation yes, and I kind of have to jump up and down because, oh, just, sorry, turn that off. Um, because I know I've been following Joe for quite a long time <laughs> through his Healing Pain podcast. And in fact, that's where I have actually made contact with a lot of the guests that we've had on here on uh, Monday night as I find out about um, different people's work in the area of healing pain. So before I dive into more about Joe and then we talk about um, nutrition, I'm uh, going to pass it over to Dr. Mark Lawrence just to get us going tonight from the Bill Nelms Pain and Research Center. Hi there. Can everybody hear me? Everybody's good. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Joe. And yeah, as Madeline said, thank you very much for coming on as a guest. This uh, is, uh, it's an exciting topic, one that, you know, I think there's a tremendous amount of interest about knowing more about. Um, it's something that's not well taught to us as physicians. It's terribly taught, actually. In fact, we know very little. So <laughs> I really, really look forward to, to tonight. In fact, you know, I had a patient today who did one of our previous nutrition things, and she said how really helpful it was because the comment was when, you know, when, when she spoke to her family doctor, he said, well, you know, just, just eat well and healthily. Well, <laughs> what does that mean? We, we don't really know. Um, that's not really well covered. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would thank you and I welcome you on behalf of the Bill Nelms Pain and Research Center. And then uh, just to our, um, the other guests, just um, view this as a confidential doctor patient group visit. Please feel free to ask questions, um, you know, in, a, in, in we will respect one another's confidentiality. No question is too silly. Uh, there are no silly questions. There's just, you know, just listening and learning from one another. So um yeah please and as i say joe welcome thank you very much for coming on tonight really really appreciate it okay great thank you so i really want to uh welcome dr joe tata who is with us from new york city and i apologize i thought it was california so i thought we were on the same time zone so it's later for him <laughs> Um, so as, as I said, oh, if you guys have been hearing me lately, you'll know that I had gum surgery. So I, I talk a little bit funny, but um, my, um, I know you've uh, been patient with me the last few weeks. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Dr. Joe Tata is really, a, he is a real leader in integrative pain care. And for myself in this field, he, his work and his podcast is often the place that I will go to, to learn about so many different aspects of pain care uh, from so many different angles. And as I said, some of our guests, including uh, Howard Schubiner and Dr. Andrea Moore, I got them directly from, I, I've been pilfing your guests from your podcast. Um, so Joe is the founder of the Integrative Pain Science Institute, and I see you put the website there. That's awesome. I'll put it up again um, at the end. And it really is a cutting edge health company focused on pain care through evidence based treatment, research and also professional development with a real focus, it seems, on um, on training physiotherapists to uh, deliver an integrative um, pain care treatment. His background, he's a doctor of physical therapy, a board certified nutrition specialist and acceptance and commitment therapy trainer that I know some of you are familiar with. Um, he's the author of two best-selling books. One is Radical Relief that we, we've actually done a group based on your book at, at the clinic. And um, so some of you will be very familiar with that book and also heal, heal Your Pain Now. 
And as I said, he's host of the Healing Pain podcast that's really worth um, checking out and an adjunct professor at both um, Arcadia University and St. John's University. And if you go to his website, you'll see there's a, a lot of different courses for health professionals on um, from mindfulness to acceptance and commitment therapy to nutrition. And it seems like a really well, well-rounded um, institute. And you can also download the five pillars of pain care if that looks um, helpful for you right from the website. So with that being said, I'm, now I get to interview uh, Dr. Joe Tata. So I'll turn it to you. And I'm really curious, Joe, um, if you, if you want to start, we're going to talk about uh, functional nutrition that uh, from what I can see, we know so much more about now and we're learning more and more all the time. And um, the medical community is just, you know, uh, um, behind and, and uh, has trouble keeping up with it. So I'm curious about that. But before we even do that, I'm, what I'm even more curious about is if you, can, if you don't mind um, telling us a little bit about how you got into being obviously so, so committed to helping deliver effective programs for people in pain. Sure, it's a great place to start. And, and thank you both Dr. Lawrence and Madeline for the invite tonight and for that introduction. I'm really excited to speak with everyone and excited to share information. So my story just on chronic pain goes way back into my personal story. Um, my mother actually struggled with chronic pain when I was a child. So probably from the age of, oh, when I was about seven to about 12, um, I watched her kind of go through this transformation of someone who was very um, depressed and anxious, um, didn't live a very healthy lifestyle, uh, wasn't sleeping well, um, struggled with all sorts of different, you know, mood swings and um, things that are common in both uh, mental as well as physical health um, ailments. And I just, I watched what she went through and I watched her kind of heal herself um, without medication, without surgery. And the interesting part was my mom was a, was a nurse. Oh, okay. So she was someone embedded in the healthcare professions. She obviously had education, um, but she still wound up in this place where she was hurting. She was in pain. Um, so it was part watching her go through that transformation process. And then at the same time, I was also exposed to medical journals and um, textbooks and things just around the house that as I got older, I would start to pick up and start to read. So I became really interested in the health professions. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in, in a, a number of different health professions. At one point, I wanted to be a psychologist. At one point, I wanted to be a physician. physician and I just wound up in physical therapy. Um, and it, it's kind of a, an interesting story kind of to close this. When I graduated from PT school, because the place I went to physical therapy school had a nursing program, had a physician's program, had a PA program, had all the health professions. And a good friend of mine who was a physician handed me an application to medical school and said, you know, you're a really smart guy. I've watched you go through this because we had some courses together. You should apply to medical school. And I said, I think being a physician is a wonderful profession, but I think there's something else to how I want to work with people. And for me, it's a, it's a non-pharmacologic, non-invasive way. Not to say that um, those interventions don't help some people, they do, and they have their place in pain care. But it's interesting because that was back in 1997 and today we're all at this place really saying, medication and surgeries, injections have their place, but how do we really support someone before they get to that spot? So that's mm -hmm. really been the transition then. Of course, I've, I've been practicing for 25 plus years um, as a physical therapist, probably somewhere around year five, I realized that exercise and movement and physical activity is extremely important. It's really kind of toward the top of the pyramid, but there are other things that are going on with chronic pain that we really can't ignore. And that's when I kind of went on my own journey of kind of exploration. So kind of did my own kind of PhD, if you will, of, okay, what's really in the literature? What does the best evidence currently say? 
with regard to helping people overcome pain. Ah, okay. Well, that, that really, it really shows in the work that you do that what, what you tend to focus on, whether it's nutrition or movement or uh, the psychological components, it's, it's very much what is working, what is actually working out there for people in pain. And it's multi faceted. So I can totally see why you went from medicine that has certain expectations around it to something that was more flexible and open to, um, well, what you do now. And, and I'm just, you know, when you were telling the story about your, your, your mother, I'm actually um, shocked that I'm assuming like way back then, I'm sure it wasn't that long ago, but that she was actually able to find at that time, some ways to help herself because so much has happened even in the last 10 years that we would never would have known back then. It's true. And I have, you know, my mom is over chronic pain now. She's um, an extremely healthy 74 year old who plays tennis and runs and goes to yoga. She's actually just about to enter into a yoga certification, a 200 hour training. So she really, oh she, she is like, I, I always want to have her like on these calls with us, but I actually asked her a while ago because she's read all my books and she follows my work. And I said, you know, what was that? What was the moment? Cause you're, you were a nurse. What was the moment in your life? Like that really caused the change to happen. What was that trigger? So to speak. And she said, you know, I just had this one day where I saw everything was slipping away. And I really just sat back and I said, I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my job. And I have to make some really solid changes. So kind of like that rock bottom place, right? And mm-hmm. I really think she wants, she would, you know, I don't know if it's just the person she is or her, you know, these are the things that I think about all the time, Madeline. Um, was it her upbringing? Um, my mom's actually a child of alcoholic parents. So there's mm-hmm. aspects of um, her caring for her family in there. She's always been a caregiver and it took her a lot to actually say, okay, I need to put myself first for a little while. Mm-hmm. And in in putting myself first and showing myself some self-love, what's on the top of my list? And for her, nutrition actually was on the top of her list Mm -hmm. for two reasons. Um, One, she had a really poor diet. And two, at that time, because of her anxiety, she was struggling with an eating disorder. Oh, okay. So those two factors kind of really came together. So I don't know if that answers your question exactly. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's kind of where the direction I, you know, what I've kind of looked when I look back at the history, that's what I look at. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it absolutely does. And that part where you, you just said, like, she knew at that point that she had to put herself first, which is last week we did, you know, why boundaries are one of the best medicines for pain, yeah. like being able to put yourself first, which sometimes comes from that place of nothing else is, is working. Um, and going right. from so, there. So. so in that, and I love that. So in that putting yourself first, just starting with where everyone is today, what's the one thing that all of us do every day? Three times a day, probably. Mm-hmm. We, we eat. We eat. Yeah. Um, so we're already doing something. We already have a habit developed mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that we can start to optimize. Now there are components of that habit we have to kind of modify and shift, but we already have that, some of that habit in place, which is really important, as you know, with regard to, you know, creating change in our life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that, should we dive into, uh, please let's, let's functional nutrition is. Yeah. It's, um, I have plenty of energy for us tonight. Um, so I'm excited to share this little presentation. I have about 40 slides. Um, it's on a variety of different topics. And really what I want to do is obviously um, share information with you and to increase your knowledge and awareness, that's first. Um, Second, I want you to become kind of interested and curious about food and how the body works. And then three, I just hope that it sparks a good conversation amongst all of us so we can learn more. Um, Okay, so let me share my screen. Just let me know if you can see that mileage so we're on the same page. Yeah. Okay, good. So we already went through a pretty good introduction. Today, I'm really going to talk about how we can use nutrition to reverse pain, to lower or treat inflammation, 
and to, re of course, reverse chronic disease. And in uh, this case, we're talking about chronic pain. Um, just a quick disclaimer, obviously this uh, webinar is for health education, health information purposes. Um, make sure you always check with a physician or another licensed medical professional before you make any changes to your health and wellness. Um, people ask me about functional nutrition and probably the, the, the topic or the question they ask me most is, can I benefit from this? Um, who can benefit from uh, changing their nutrition or a functional nutrition approach? Most of the patients who come to me have a combination of one or more of the, the complaints or symptoms that you see on the screen there. So they're looking to maintain a healthy weight, right? So we know how important weight management is for our overall health, but I'll talk a little bit about pain later on. They have some type of gastrointestinal complaint, things like um, gastrointestinal pain, bloating, gas, um, what, we have, what we might identify as IBS, um, constipation, all sorts of different pain, whether it's joint pain or migraines or autoimmune disease or neuropathic pain. They often complain of low energy. Oftentimes all of these have some type of brain-based component to them, meaning that there's um, confusion or brain fog that can be there. There can be depression, anxiety that overlap with all these. Um, high blood sugar and diabetes or pre-diabetes, and then oftentimes other lifestyle factors like problem sleeping, which many times people don't even uh, connect to with the food they're eating. Mm -hmm. um, two books that, um, of course, Madeline, thank you so much for mentioning the first book, and I would love to hear about how your group went with Radical Relief, but the other book that I will just turn you to as a resource, because there's gonna be a lot of information here today, um, a lot of what I speak about today, you can actually find in my first book, which is called Heal Your Pain Now. There's three chapters in there, just on nutrition. So um, if Great. you're interested in, in the nutrition part, um, you'll find that in the Heal Your Pain Now book where the Radical Relief book is more of a, a mindfulness approach. Um, we already spoke about this before. Most of the patients who come to me are really saying, hey, Dr. Joe, I've taken all the medicines, I've had surgery, I've had the injections, what else is there for me? And that's really the question that I started to ask myself too in clinical practice. How else can I support people if they're choosing to um, either not go this direction or if they have gone this direction and they wanna optimize their recovery. And it's really this, let's start to look at food as nature's pharmacy. So instead of going to the drugstore, and sometimes instead of asking the physician, what medication um, can you prescribe for me? As I mentioned before, you're already doing something three times a day that has powerful pain relieving properties to it. And that's food. I no longer look at food as um, energy um, or nutrition. I look at food as a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And somewhere embedded in a healthy pattern of eating, there are natural chemicals that can alleviate many of the symptoms that I mentioned on the first couple of slides. Um, here's something for you to consider though. The national dietary guidelines that are common in all of the Western uh, nations, the United States, Canada, the UK, Australia, national guidelines are what we would consider at this point as basic, very basic nutrition advice. And that nutrition advice really was created from studying healthy individuals, people who did not have chronic pain, people who were not struggling with obesity, uh, people who did not have diabetes. So when you look at, let's say, um, general guide, dietary guidelines, or sometimes even if you see um, a health professional, maybe a dietitian, they may be working, um, as one of our colleagues said here um, earlier on in the evening, they may be working from not enough information. And actually we know that nutrition really isn't taught in most um, medical programs, physical therapy included. Um, there's probably only about maybe 20 hours of nutrition taught in a physical therapy um, program in the United States. In most medical programs, it's about nine. Hmm. So most of us as health professionals um, are coming from a place where we don't know a lot about nutrition. We're learning. I've studied nutrition for the past 20 years. Um, it is a very deep and a very broad topic, but just know that general nutrition guidelines are meant for the general public health. They're not intended to be guidelines for treating disease. Thank you. That's an important uh, distinction there. 
It is, and that's where we really turn to functional nutrition. So functional nutrition looks at you as a uh, biochemically unique individual, meaning based on your genes, based on your hereditary factors, based on the environment you grew up in, based on your um, sex and your gender, based on your age, based on your diagnosis that you're unique. And you'll probably respond to food different than the way I might respond to food and nutrition. So what we do with functional nutrition is we really take a precision medicine approach. So it's looking at not only your condition, but looking at you as a whole person and saying, how is nutrition going to interact with you? And how do we develop a program that's unique for you? With functional nutrition, it, we really start with what's called healing the gut. So you may have heard the expression that all um, health starts in the gut. And we have a lot of research now to support this. Everything from um, physical ailments to mental health ailments to chronic pain. And we're going to kind of touch on all those topics as we go through today's um, little webinar here. If I had to just, if I, if I had to um, ask you to take away five important factors of why gut health is so important, is that when you have a healthy gut, it absorbs the nutrients that comes in through your diet. If your gut is not healthy, even if you're eating or even if you start to eat healthy foods, you don't absorb the nutrients as, as easily. Um, your gut maintains a barrier. So believe it or not, when you swallow things, yes, you're taking in healthy nutrition, but sometimes there's like bad bacteria and fungus and viruses on food, right? Many of you have had food poisoning. That's just an example. So your gut is that lining, it's that barrier. It protects you from things that are coming in from the outside world. So the healthier your gut is, in essence, the healthier you are. And there's some, I don't wanna go off on a tangent, but there's some really good research now that when COVID starts to shift from just mild symptoms to the symptoms that become um, more debilitating for people, it's that that infection has actually um, uh, gone through the gut barrier, gone through the gut barrier wall and entered into your circulation, entered into your bloodstream. Yeah. Um, your gut eliminates and detoxifies. So we all poop and pee, right? Um, you should be pooping at least once a day. We're talking about poop here. We, if we're going to talk about nutrition, we have to talk about elimination or pooping. All of us should be pooping at least once a day. I'm going to go into some of the things that um, impact that, especially with chronic pain populations a little bit later on. Um, your gut is home to what's called the microbiome. So there's a whole community, there's a whole ecosystem living inside your gut. And we'll go into that later. And then finally, and most importantly, when, when it comes to pain, your gut communicates with your brain and your nervous system. So there's this bi-directional communication happening between your brain and your gut. And the nerve, we actually have a nervous system in our gut and that nervous system in our gut is as big as the nervous system in our brain. So we kind of look at the brain as like um, kind of the, the master of the nervous system, but in reality, we actually have another brain that's actually in our gut. There's a whole nervous system in our gut that is uh, that has essential functions in the body that we'll go through a little bit later. So this is a, a kind of a more technical, but a snapshot of what the inside of your gut looks like. So this is the inside up here, kind of the top here. And this is the inside of your body. Oops, sorry. This is the inside of your body. There's a one cell layer that separates um, the inside of your gut. So your gut's a tube, right? Your intestines are a tube. So there's a one cell layer. That tube is a one cell layer. And what's really interesting about that layer is that it provides protection. It has a structural barrier and it also regulates metabolism. So we think about metabolism, metabolism happening kind of with like um, uh, you know, calories and burning energy, but believe it or not, your gut modulates your metabolism. Mm -hmm. When you kind of go deeper into the gut microbiome, there are 400 trillion gut microbes. There are probably as many gut microbes as we have cells in our body. So you are as much human as you are gut microbiome. 
Now with that, our microbiome has genes, just like we have genes, and those genes turn on and off certain functions in our body. Our microbiome regulates inflammation. Inflammation is highly correlated with chronic pain. Our microbiome produces essential vitamins and minerals. So we get vitamins and minerals not only from the food we eat, but then our microbiome takes that food and creates more vitamins and minerals, which we then absorb. Our microbiome produces hormones and neurotransmitters. There's a myth out there that your brain produces the hormone and neurotransmitters. The truth is your gut microbiome probably produces about half of the hormones and neurotransmitters that your body uses. It kills the bad bugs. So the good bugs can compete and kill the bad bugs in there. It regulates your immune function. We know that your nervous system and your immune system work hand in hand. So when you have a healthy diet, not only does it upregulate your immunity, it also upregulates your nervous system in a healthy way. So those are some of the things that the, the gut microbiome do. Um, there are trillions of dollars being invested in research around the gut microbiome. Of course, we're discovering that within 24 hours, when you change your diet within 24 hours, your gut microbiome changes the composition. So if you have some bad bugs in your gut, as you change your diet over a 24 hour period, it'll shift from bad bugs to good bugs. And in essence helps regulate all of these processes here on the right hand side of the screen. That's incredible. <laughs> um, just look, it is really incredible, isn't it? We, know, we don't really think about that, you know, cause it's inside of us. So it's not something we can see, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but just, just bring our awareness to it really has an impact on, okay, what I'm putting into my body has an impact on how I feel. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, another kind of just look at that one cell layer. Um, when the cells are healthy, they're tight together. So they create that barrier. When the cell lining becomes injured, um, some cells die off and some cells actually start to separate. So there's a, um, a space where things can pass through and they can enter into um, your circulation or your blood vessels. Things like vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients keep the cells of your gut healthy. Um, undigested food particles um, can actually injure the lining of your gut and cause inflammation. Infections can cause inflammation in the gut. Medications can be a double-edged sword. At the right dosage and for the proper period of time, some medications can actually heal your gut. There are medications when you take them too long or take them inappropriately, they can actually damage your gut lining. And then finally, stress. Think about how you feel when you're nervous or you're anxious, right? You have butterflies in your stomach or sometimes you have to feel like you have to have a bowel movement. Um, stress has a significant impact on the health of your gut. That's why we looked at in things like mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, when you train in those, um, it's shown to have an impact on immune function as well as your gut function. Um, that gut lining I was talking about, when it becomes injured, some people call that leaky gut. That's a kind of layman term for it. I'm okay to use that terminology. Um, the more technical term is what's called um, intestinal permeability. The two biggest factors, if you're concerned about intestinal permeability, is one, the overuse of antibiotics. Um, disturbs the gut lining and the microbiome in your gut, which can cause leaky gut. The other thing is that shift in the um, healthy bugs in your gut. When you eat high sugar foods, specifically high fructose corn syrup, um, which has a combination of fructose and glucose, that it causes what's called intestinal bacterial overgrowth, meaning the bad bugs kind of grow and outnumber the good bugs and then it can cause that leaky gut to happen. Um, other ones that are probably wanna be on your radar, um, just a poor diet overall, we already spoke about the microbiome. Opioids, opioids have a negative impact on the gut microbiome, as do non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, as do surgery. Surgery is actually like a small trauma to your body. And whenever your body undergoes a trauma, whether it's small or large, sometimes it's a transitory leaky gut that happens. Um, the more traumatic a surgery is and the longer you're under anesthesia, 
uh, there's pretty good research showing that leaky gut is more associated with longer, more traumatic types of surgeries. And, and Joe, would those, that surgery be any, any type? It's the process of surgery. It's not surgery on your gut. That's correct. It's just the, any surgery overall is, you know, stressful. um, it's any surgery is stressful. Um, I, you know, I had, um, it's really funny. I had my tonsils taken out when I was 28 years old, which is old, pretty old. Most people have them taken out when they're children. And I really, you know, if, at that point I was already practicing I, and I knew about, you know, surgery being, being um, challenging for some people, but I never realized how anesthesia really affects the body. Mm. And anesthesia slows down many of our normal processes, mm -hmm. including our gut function, including our nervous system function. So one of the biggest challenges with surgery, of course, we have to have anesthesia, but just know the longer you're under surgery, typically um, the more challenging it can be. Okay. And just so people know that number four is like uh, ibuprofen and, and medications like that, eh? Hey? Yeah, ibuprofen, uh, Advil, Advil that, yep. yeah. I believe I have a slide on that coming up, but yep, that's okay. there. Um, things that disrupt your gut ecosystem, um, your weight. So I, don't, I, I wanna be sensitive around weight because there's a lot of talk about weight and chronic pain. Mm -hmm. um, the truth is being slightly overweight um, really does not have an association with chronic pain. So if you're slightly overweight, that's okay when you move into the higher categories of obesity. So obesity typically is categorized in about four different categories, one, two, three, and four. As you increase those categories, your weight increases. As your BMI increases, pain starts to increase. So being slightly overweight, I wouldn't really worry about that too much. If you're in the obese category, that's when you start to say to yourself, okay, the obesity is having an impact on my overall health and my pain. We'll talk a little bit about um, weight in a little while. Um, antibiotics are already mentioned. Um, stool transit time. Some people naturally have um, healthy transit time, meaning food moves through their system at a, a normal rate. Um, they uh, urinate on a regular, regular basis and they poop at least once or twice a day. Some people have different transit times and we just have to be just cognizant of, of that, but still know that for most of us, we should be having a bowel movement, especially at least once a day. Things that affect our ecosystem because it can kind of increase or decrease that transit time. Um, one are laxatives. Now I have laxatives on the screen here because many people who are taking opioids struggle with constipation. Mm -hmm. Now constipation slows down transit time. When you have um, partially digested or digested food sitting in your gut for a long time, um, it starts to shift your um, gut in a not healthy way. So if, it's, if, if your stool is sitting in your intestine for too long of a period of time, that's not healthy, right? So we have to move it through the body. Um, if you're relying on laxatives, then what happens is you're moving um, substances through your gut too early. And oftentimes water and healthy nutrients come out with the stool as well. Mm -hmm. And then finally, proton pump inhib inhibitors, um, PPIs that you see on the screen there, a lot of people take those for um, indigestion. Um, proton pump inhibitors decrease the natural enzymes in your intestine that break down food. So shifting to a healthy diet will not only help with your, um, your GERD, your digestive problems, but it'll help you move off some of these proton pump inhibitors, which decrease digestion. Now, if you don't have the stomach acid and the enzymes to break down food, that means you're not absorbing the nutrition into your body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting, Joe, about the PPIs. Um, really a struggle for some, some patients to get off PPIs, but at the same time, the side effects. Um, it's, it's really fascinating, you know, what, what you're saying. Um, you know, the struggle is just to sometimes get them off a PPI. Um, yeah, and, and you know, um, Dr. Lawrence, oftentimes these happen at the same time. So it's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, optim as we optimize the diet, then we can slowly start to, you know, wean off of medications. Um, you know, one of the things about PPIs that concern me the most is um, the proton pump inhibitors um, in the gut. When we look at the gut, um, 
they tend to stop the, I'm going to talk a little bit technical here because we're, you know, talking about um, proteins, but it stops the cleaving of uh, large proteins into individual amino acids. Yeah. Um, those amino acids, of course, are used to build muscle. Uh, they're used to build bone. And a lot of those amino acids are used to um, create neurotransmitters that we want to optimize in our, um, you know, chronic pain population who are oftentimes struggling with mental health challenges. So that's the proton pump inhibitors um, are something interesting for us to take into consideration. Absolutely. Um, do they also affect um, the, the mag magnesium and the absorption of magnesium? They can. There's, there's some research around that as well, that there are certain, um, certain, and I have this in a later slide. Um, okay. Maybe I should just hold that so we get to the later slide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, so we talked about NSAIDs a little bit here. Um, within about 12 hours, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can cause an increase in intestinal permeability. That doesn't mean you have a leaky gut after 12 hours. It just means that if you're taking these medications, some people take Advil twice a day and they've been taking it for years, just know that over time that can lead to inflammation in your small intestine, which, which can interrupt um, your gut health. There is one uh, population of patients that I always talk to gut health about, and those are people with autoimmune disease. Um, the research is quite clear now that there are three things that are required to develop an autoimmune condition. There has to be some type of trigger in your life that trigger leads to leaky gut or what's called intestinal permeability. And then you have to have the gene, the one gene or many genes probably that turn on autoimmune disease. And these happen in somewhat of a sequence, but they all have to happen together. Um, many people have triggers, um, but they don't have the gene for it, so to speak. Or sometimes it's a, it's a matter of um, multiple triggers over the course of your lifetime that then cause this cascade to happen. Um, there are three stages to autoimmunity. Um, most of us don't realize there's a silent phase where we can actually measure that there are elevated um, autoimmune antibodies, where you'll see elevated antibodies on um, serum, but there are no symptoms and there are no loss of function. Uh, there's probably a reactive phase where you start to have some symptoms, things like pain, swelling, redness, tenderness, um, skin irritation, but there's not a severe tissue destruction. And then finally, there's a disease phase, which is uh, you know, the part where, where people are having uh, placed on disease modified anti rheumatic drugs, they're having joints replaced, um, imaging study shows up. So the reason why I bring that up is because we can help a lot of people who are in the reactive phase. And even in the silent phase, if the physician is uh, screening for that, but especially the reactive phase, we can prevent or slow the progression of the disease moving into the disease phase where there's significant tissue to damage, which is what we're really trying to prevent um, specifically in the autoimmune population. Um, the gut-brain connection. This is an area that all of us are gonna be paying a really, really close attention to. And I've taken a really complicated topic and I boiled it down to the three most important factors with regard to the gut-brain connection. Um, there's a direct connection between all of the organs in your gut and your brain. It's one very large nerve. It's probably about the size of one of my fingers. It's very thick and it's called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve communicates between your gut and your brain. So really what your brain is saying, your brain is saying, okay, my job is protection. I have to know what's going on at all times around me. I do that through my sight. I do that through sound. I do that through smell, through taste, through touch, right? I can scan the outside of my world, but I'm also concerned about what I brought in from the outside into my body. And that's really what the vagus nerve is doing. It's really saying, okay, what did you bring into your body? And is it helpful or is it harmful? Now, as the vagus nerve samples what's happening in your gut, it sends signals up to your brain. 
and it can modulate your nervous system. So if, you're, if your vagus nerve senses that there's inflammation in your gut, then it'll upregulate your nervous system, meaning it makes your nervous system more sensitive. And we know that uh, uh, the more sensitive our nervous system becomes, typically the more pain we'll have. Um, in combination with your gut microbiome, some of the cells in your gut modulate your immune system. They communicate with your immune system. So we think of our immune system as kind of these cells floating around in our, our blood supply. Actually, 70% of your immune system lives in your gut. The microbiome is communicating with your immune system and the cells in your gut um, are that um, transport where the communication happens. And then finally, I think I mentioned this before, most of the hormones and neurotransmitters um, that your brain relies on are actually produced in your gut. Things like serotonin, and even natu natural opioids, which our body does produce, are actually produced in our gut. And they wind up in our cir circulation, they're transported, and they actually move through the vagus nerve. I think that, <clears throat> that slide right there was um, worth, worth the webinar. <laughs> if you guys want to come back and listen to that, because we've talked uh, uh, about the vagus nerve in many, many different ways, and you've taken a very complex um, uh, uh, complex system and really brought it down to what I, what I'm wondering now is all the exercises that we've done with breathing and, um, you know, triggering the vagus nerves, uh, to put us into rest and digest, which is all great. But if you have an unhealthy microbiome and the vagus nerve is like, is picking up on all these bad bacteria, it's, you're kind of working against yourself almost yeah, for so you're, optimum you're, vagus nerve health. Your vagus nerve is a wonderful multitasker. Must be. So it's looking at the health of your gut. It's looking at your respiratory patterns. It's modulating your stress, um, heart rate and rhythm, all that. It, the vagus nerve is interested in all that that's happening. Um, and nutrition is a big factor. So yeah, just because... Um, for example, I teach patients lots of different grounding techniques. Grounding techniques are wonderful ways um, to regulate your autonomic nervous system, which your vagus mm -hmm. nerve is kind of at the center of that. Mindfulness exercise is really great for that. Um, but it's only one part of it. We can't, um, how do I say this delicately? We have to be mindful of what we eat as we're mindful of our thoughts. Um, yeah, that's, that's really what, really what it comes down to. And even if you look at the mindfulness traditions, mindful eating is a part of mindfulness. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you said the vagus nerve, um, uh, modulates or uh, is on guard for what's coming into the body. It also made me think of what else we're ingesting like food wise for sure. Cause we're talking about that, but what you said also about thoughts, what are we taking in, in other ways of toxicity, in our lives that revs up the nervous system. And, but anyway, that's a whole other, back to gut health. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just some seven quick ways where you can maintain um, gut health or good gut health. Um, drink plenty of water. Um, you'd be surprised how much water your gut needs and it does help regulate transit through your gut. Um, I already mentioned pooping a couple of times. Make sure you're pooping at least once a day. Plant forward eating, most of your diet about 80% of what you're eating should be some form of plant. Um, exercise and moving your body. Exercise helps regulate your bowels. Um, probiotic foods, you can either find those, uh, you know, obviously in the health food store or you can take them in supplement form. Um, high fiber diets, the microbes in your gut are, what, what feeds them is your diet. So you're feeding your gut microbiome, you're feeding those microbes. What they eat are, are fibers. They eat the fibers in the plant food that we eat. So when you eat things like fruits and vegetables, which are high in fiber, your gut loves that. So eat a variety of plant food. It's not just kale, it's not just spinach. The more variety of plant food you eat, the more a variety of gut microbiome you're gonna have and the better you're gonna feel. And then of course, um, working some type of stress buffering activity um, into your life is always important. Um, a term I really recommend you start to um, just work with is, is what I'm eating inflammatory 
or anti-inflammatory. One of the things I help patients when they start to look at food, like, I don't know what to eat. So it's like, okay, let's just start to look at what's inflammatory and what's anti-inflammatory. Um, when we look at inflammation in the body, the technical term is of what's called reactive oxygen species. Um, diet is a big factor with regard to reactive oxygen species, but it's not the only factor. Um, being sedentary, alcoholism, smoking, water pollution, stress, lack of sleep, all those create what are called free radicals. Those free radicals damage our cells and they cause inflammation. Um, our body is able to modulate this via antioxidants. Antioxidants are what are in our foods. So yes, there are vitamins and nutrients in our food, but antioxidants is something that most people don't talk about. The antioxidants are what causes that anti-inflammatory process to happen in our body. Um, here's what causes inflammation. A, a pretty good thing that all of you can kind of look at. There's something that are called advanced glycation end products. Um, for short, they're called ages, which they actually do age you um, because they're inflammatory. And anything that's inflammatory tends to age you faster. But the way you can identify inflammation in your diet is anything that has a brownness to it, anything that looks brown and charred is in essence inflammatory. And it's, on, it's undergone some type of change. So for example, with the donut on the left-hand side, we've taken dough and then we have um, placed it probably into hot oil and fried it. And that dough has browned and that, that browning is what's called an advanced glycation end product. Um, fried chicken on the right. So you bread the, the chicken and you fry it, same thing, um, advanced glycation end product. Uh, this is creme brulee, which um, most of you would say is delicious, and it is. Um, but that browning that you see on the top, where they take the sugar under high heat, um, is, is inflammatory. And that exists in many of the processed foods that we eat. Um, our standard diet, the standard Western diet, is really full of this. So these potatoes um, are inflammatory in some way. Um, the fried burger is, as well as um, the browning that happens with wheat products. Now with nutrition overall, it's, it's hard to talk about nutrition without talking about um, a few different conditions, um, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and diabetes. We now have enough information. The literature is very clear that if you develop one or more of these conditions, you're likely to develop a chronic pain condition. And if you develop a chronic pain condition, you're likely, if it goes untreated, you know, receive proper treatment, you're likely to develop one of these other um, non-communicable diseases they're called, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity. So it's a bi-directional relationship that happens here. There's good news here because it tells us as we start to treat obesity and treat diabetes and treat cardiovascular disease, your pain can get better as well. So there's a, there's a, it's a component that we have to be aware of. Um, obesity does hurt for some people. A couple different reasons why. First is just there's an extra load on your joints. When there's extra load on your joints, that mechanical load can lead to more pain. Um, obesity does change the gut microbiome. Obesity itself is an inflammatory condition. Any inflammatory condition can contribute to a chronic pain syndrome. Um, there are some pretty good studies, both in animal studies as well as humans, that people who have extra weight on them have a lower threshold or and a lower tolerance to pain. And then finally, mood disorders are more likely in people who are obese, and we know that mood disorders can have an impact on chronic pain. Um, I would like to share with you a guide to losing weight, because I, I don't think that this is shared enough. And this is something that will help with your chronic pain as well as helping you maintain a healthy weight. So really the research is quite clear that any evidence-based um, diet, a Mediterranean diet, a paleo diet, a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, any evidence-based plant-forward diet will help you maintain a healthy weight. 
Um, second there is shifting your diet from where you're, you're drinking uh, sugary drinks, drinks that have uh, sugar added to them, soft drinks being the major one, to mostly water or herbal tea as your primary source of fluid in your diet. Um, restricting added sugar, refined grains, and processed foods. Those three right there, added sugars, refined grain products, and processed foods. If you restrict those and instead substitute whole fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, and protein, without counting calories, is a good way to lose weight. Now, I'm not saying calories aren't important. Most people just don't, uh, most people fail at counting calories, me included. It's a very difficult thing to count calories. So instead, just choose smaller portions. Put less food on your plate, basically. If you can decrease the amount of food you put on your plate by about 20%, you'll do a really good job at reducing the amount of calories um, that you're eating. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good way to look at it. It's not so stressful. Um, just a, a question. Uh, you talked about the brown, the brown and chard. Um, it, that has the, uh, um, is not it, to stay away from. But also I think what you're saying is the whites as well, like the white breads, the sugars. Is right, that so fair to say? Yeah, when, so when we start talking about restricting added sugars, refined grains, and processed foods, um, typically those, those are flour products, um, wheat products, sugar products. Yep, that's correct. Right, and like things like potatoes, rice, crackers, that would be that would come under. Well, but, so a, a white potato um, is does not have a whole lot of nutrient content to it. It's mostly just a carbohydrate. Mm, it's got um, sugar. Yeah. Yeah. All carbohydrates break down to sugar. Now, rice, if you're eating like brown or black rice, um, that has a higher fiber content. So that can actually be a healthy part of your diet. So that falls under the whole grain category. White mm -hmm. rice, which is actually highly processed, um, the fiber is taken out of it and it kind of breaks down to sugar much more rapidly in your bloodstream. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Decreasing sedentary time. So all of us spend a whole lot of time in front of screens nowadays, um, just trying to decrease the amount of screen time and sedentary behaviors. Um, increasing aerobic exercise and strength training. Um, the guidelines you see the 30 to 60 minutes, uh, five times a week are for healthy people. I don't necessarily recommend that for people with chronic pain, but that might be something you start to aim for or work with your physical therapist on. Um, and then finally, consistency. Consistency is most important. It's not uh, the special exercise or the special diet. It's the combination of all of the above that you can maintain for the longest period of time. Um, this goes back to the conversation we were having before about uh, proton pump inhibitors. Um, I often talk about opioids first, um, but the truth is almost every medication on the market when taken for a long period of time, depletes some type of essential nutrient. It's unclear, the science is unclear as to why this happens. Um, we don't know why this happens in the body, but opioids specifically, there are studies done on opioids um, with regard to nutrient depletions. And you see there on the right-hand side of the screen, all of those essential vitamins and minerals can be depleted if you're on long-term use of opioids um, or too high of a dose of opioids. So it really makes, and I'm not saying that you should come off an opioid. What I'm saying is that nutrition is really important if you're on an opioid and you're working your way off that opioid as well. Um, I don't have a list of every single medication, um, but you can find that online. But many of the medications that uh, people with chronic pain take um, either one or more essential nutrients become depleted when these medications are taken long-term. And you can mitigate that with diet somewhat. Right. So it's what you're saying, which is good. Yes. So we were talking about the amino acids, for example. Um, if, you, if proton pump inhibitors are uh, interfering with uh, gastric secretion and breaking down protein, we just have to be aware of that and just start to look at, okay, What's the protein like in your diet? Maybe we increase the protein a little bit for you um, since some of it may not be uh, absorbed. Um, supplementation actually comes in handy here as well. 
um, because it's another way to get essential uh, vitamins and minerals into, into the diet. Mm -hmm. um, a topic that I'm talking about more and more, not only with my patients who have chronic pain, but really just with everyone, is our mental well being. Really, over the past two years with COVID, I think this is just the most important topic. Um, the rates of anxiety and depression have skyrocketed. Um, they're still there. They really haven't come down much since um, our pandemic. Um, we know that antidepressants and psychotherapy are important for people with mental illness and for our mental well being. However, it probably only helps about 50% of people with depression. So there's a lot of people out there who are saying, okay, I this helped a little bit, um, or maybe it didn't help at all, what else is available to me? And there's a whole field now called nutritional psychiatry that is looking at diet, both in healthy eating patterns, so the overall pattern of how you eat, as well as certain nutrients and saying, okay, it does show if we're eating a, a typical uh, processed food Western diet, that there's an increased risk of depression. And as, our, as we start to shift toward a healthy plant-based diet, that, that incidence starts to decrease significantly. Um, we also know that depression has a lot of overlaps with chronic pain. So again, just think if there's something you can do three times a day for both your um, physical pain as well as your emotional pain, nutrition is one of those factors. Any questions on that, Madeline, from you? I know that this is a topic of interest for you. Oh, oh, it's very much a topic of uh, interest. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's just a great reminder that there are other ways, like other tools, other doorways in um, if you're suffering with depression. And if you have pain, it's very, very worthwhile um, uh, taking your depression seriously and, and treating it as part of your chronic pain treatment. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that people do, uh, the other thing I, I try to help people become aware of is that um, our brain <laughs> is very metabolically active. It's the most metabolically active organ we have in our body, meaning it requires a lot of nutrition, it requires a lot of energy. When you have chronic pain, you have more attention on pain, meaning thoughts are flowing more often. The more you're thinking, the more you're ruminating about things, there's, an ex there's a metabolic expense that starts to happen in your nervous system. So in essence, you're, you wanna feed your nervous system things that are healthy. So when you're doing things like cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, um, that neuroplasticity that, that starts to happen there, um, neuroplasticity requires nutrition, right? For nerves to grow and sprout and make connections, mm -hmm. um, there are certain chemical reactions that have to happen uh, nutrients are what support those chemical reactions. That makes a lot, of, a lot of sense. Like that, why, how important this is. And I'm just thinking about um, also people that have had uh, uh, trauma or PTSD, and there's a lot going on. Yeah. There's a lot of real estate being taken up by thoughts and feelings and all kinds of things. And how important it would be to feed. Um, to feed ourselves so that you, you have an optimum environment for all that to be happening. Yeah, I mean, managing our thoughts is metabolically expensive. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna Meaning we need, to, yeah. we need to feed our thoughts in a way, right? So we need to feed ourselves healthy thoughts, like literally, right? That's where cognitive reappraisal comes in. Mm -hmm. But we also need to realize that our nervous system needs the, the nutrition to make those new connections for neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure it improves memory then too, because the brain is not so taxed um, and drained and fatigued. Uh, that's right. There's a, as I mentioned before, the people come in, they say, I feel fatigued. Fatigue really is a nervous system based symptom. Mm -hmm. It's not a muscle based symptom, it's a nervous it's an system. Overload. Yeah. Uh, or an that's overwhelm. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so we want to, you know, nurture our nervous system. And one of the ways we nurture our nervous system is through nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which brings me to plant forward eating. So I like the term plant forward, which means I'm moving my diet in a forward direction 
toward including more plant-based products in my diet. Doesn't mean you're a vegan, doesn't mean you're a vegetarian, doesn't mean you never eat meat or poultry or seafood or dairy. It just means that you're starting to shift your diet where when you look at the plates, you look at the plates on the right-hand side there, most of that is plant-based foods. There are plants there. Um, as you begin to do that, you minimize the things I was speaking about before. You minimize processed foods. You minimize sugar. You also minimize anything that's added to foods. There are a lot of additives that are added to foods that have an impact on our nervous system and our brain as well. Um, so things like fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, um, healthy oils like olive oil, whole grains, um, beans and legumes, all that becomes part of the diet. Now, the reason why is because in the, remember I mentioned before, um, food is our pharmacy, right? Well, in each of our, in our food, when you look at the color of fruits and vegetables, each of those colors oftentimes are associated with a certain type of phytonutrient. Each of those phytonutrients has a particular um, benefit. It's like, it's like medicine, right? So some of them are anti-inflammatory. So the phenols that you find in grapes are anti-inflammatory. The saponins, which are that orange rich color you find like sweet potatoes and yams are anti-oncogenic, which are cancer forming. Um, the carotenoids, which are in carrots, carotenoids, carrots, they're free radical scavengers. So they're anti-inflammatory. Um, some of them have antioxidant properties. Some of them have antibacterial properties. So garlic actually helps the bacteria in your gut. Some of them protect your DNA. There are so many different qualities, medicinal qualities of your food that I can't even talk about them really even just in one lecture. But just know that as you, the more variety you have in your diet, the more variety of fruits and vegetables, the more colorful your diet looks. So when you sit down and look at your plate, when you eat, eat dinner, you should say, okay, do I see something on my plate that is red, green, orange, yellow, white, brown, purple? Just go through the rainbow. Is the rainbow on my plate? If the rainbow is on my plate, then I'm feeding myself these medicinal plants that can help with my health as well as my pain. That, that's another really uh, user-friendly, you know, way to remember. Um, and and I, I once read somebody that suggested to try, just try a different vegetable from the vegetable section every week for like a month or a couple of months. And that was also just a really good experiment in things that I just never pick up because I don't even know what they are. Uh, but to you know have more variety of colors and when you realize nature is color coded for your health it's it's quite um it's quite amazing yeah that's funny so i i i advised a patient of mine to do that one day that exact thing i said what i want you to do this week is grow the grocery store every day and pick out one new vegetable and she did it for two days and on the third day she got really smart and she said, you know, when I'm in the produce section, there's one place where all the fruits and vegetables, you can buy them sing singularly, individually, right? And then there's this other section over here where they have vegetables in bags and boxes, and they're actually mixed. Mm. And she said, you know, if I buy the bag of mixed vegetables, I'm actually more likely to get all the color on my plate because in the bag are broccoli green, cauliflower, white, um, carrots, sweet potatoes, orange. And those, when you have those mixes, oftentimes you just like put them in the microwave or you saute them with some olive oil and it becomes really easy because we all want things that are fast and easy with food too, right? Um, mm -hmm. We're busy. Um, but you can find things like that in the supermarket where they've already done some of the work for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, that's true in those bags. Yeah, or, in the, yeah, or in the bags or... Um, for example, like I love for lunch, like one of my favorite lunches is um, what they call 50-50 salad mix. So in the store, they sell these big plastic bins. It's called 50-50 salad mix. There are all these different types of mixed greens, spinach, kale, all together. So I know I'm getting my mixed greens and I put some protein on top of it and a healthy um, grain, um, which kind of brings me to the next um, aspect here, which is 
Um, how do you set up your plate? Because we're all eating, right? We're all eating off of a plate. Uh-oh. Oops. Oh, <clears throat> Joe, you just froze. Hmm. I'm not frozen, am I? No. 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 Joe froze, though. Joe. He might have to. Um... Um, Harvard. There you go. Harvard. Oh, sorry, Harvard. Joe. You were frozen there. Oops. Darn. Frozen again. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he doesn't realize that. I can just send him a, a quick um, message. Yeah. Oh, oh there you are. Uh, are you back? Oh, you were frozen. Oh, Joe, you're on mute. How about now? There. Perfect. There you go. Okay. So I was saying the Harvard School of Medicine has done a really nice job at creating a healthy eating plate. Um, what I like about this plate is it shows you how to organize the, the food on your plate and it gives you suggestions about what you should be eating. Um, you can take a screenshot of this. You can find this online. Just Google Harvard healthy eating plate. I use this with a lot of my patients and it just shows you kind of how to set the food up on your plate and what should be included in each category. Um, this is a plate I use with my clients oftentimes. Oops. Oh no. Yeah. We're losing them. They ask, well, can I get there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, this is another plate that I offer to my uh, patients and clients. Just because I on this plate, I added uh, some probiotic. So probiotics are very good for your gut. And People often ask about wine. Um, my response always is a serving of wine is actually four ounces. It's a lot less than you think it is. So a serving of wine about four times a week can be part of a healthy diet. It doesn't mean you have to start drinking. If you like to enjoy wine, four ounces, which is a pretty small serving, four times a week is part of a healthy diet. Um, Recommendations from the experts. Um, we're gonna move through some of this a little bit faster. Um, again, those general dietary, dietary guidelines, and, and of course for me, it's the US dietary guidelines. They recommend between three to, uh, three, to two, three servings of vegetables, two servings of fruit, a total of five. Um, if you look at different organizations, it actually increases to nine. I recommend that my clients aim for nine servings of plant food total. Usually it's five servings of vegetables, about three or four servings of fruit. Um, when I place people on nutrition programs, I follow what's called a, a 5R program. So we remove inflammatory foods. We work on repairing the gut, replace inflammatory foods with whole nutrient dense foods and supplements. We repopulate our gut with probiotic and probiotic foods. And then we work on relaxation, things like exercise and mindfulness to help with the gut. Mm -hmm. um, people always ask if I had to recommend like the one diet, so to speak, for people. There's, there is no one diet. But if you had to go all in, which can be challenging for some people, but if you have to go all in and make a big change in your life, this would be the slide that I recommend. So on the left-hand side, you'd be eating lower glycemic fruits. So fruit has a sugar content to it. Um, if you have pre-diabetes or, or diabetes, things like um, mango can be very high in fruit, uh, very high in sugar. So you wanna aim for the lower glycemic or fruits with lower sugar in them. Typically those are berries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, et cetera. And how much is a, is a serving of fruit? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, a serving of fruit is a, a, a modest size apple is a serving of fruit. Okay. Well, yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, a handful of, of blueberries is about a, a serving of fruit. Okay. Yeah. It's like a um, handful. Yeah. Yeah. Leafy greens, all different types of leafy greens, very healthy for you. Um, tubers and root vegetables. 
nuts and seeds, beans. Um, I do recommend a gluten-free diet. So things like quinoa, rice, and oats are okay. Um, healthy fats, oily fish, olives and olive oil, avocados, avocado oil, um, eggs, recommend eating the whole egg. And then finally, milk alternatives, things like almond milk or coconut milk. So this is what my clients are eating when they come to me. Um, things to reduce, eliminate, avoid, um, sugar. If you need a little bit of sweetness, you can uh, use organic stevia. Um, I eliminate artificial sweeteners because they kind of trick the nervous system into thinking you're eating something sweet, but they can also cause cravings for people. So I don't use artificial sweeteners. Um, processed foods come out of the diet. Um, two food additives, monosodium glutamate and aspartame are added to food. They typically um, increase the taste of food to make things taste better, but they're also known to sensitize the nervous system. Really? Yep. Um, in children as well as adults. Lots of good research around that. Okay. Um, uh, it is a dairy-free diet. So removing milk and cheese products, those, are, those can be triggers for many people. Um, soy and soy products can be triggers and corn and corn products can be inflammatory triggers as well. Mm, interesting. And I think we should go to questions. That's the end of my presentation. Okay. Great. Wow. So, so much in there. Thank you. There are some questions. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and yeah, and I have some too. Um, there is one I just wanted to go back and find here uh, from Stan. Um, oh, where was it? Oh, Stan, I don't know if you want to write that. Oh, yes. Um, with, with, with constipation, with a hernial constipation, um, any ideas on, on supplements that you can take? Supplements for constipation? For like a hernial constipation, for constipation. Well, there are fiber supplements out there you can take. Um, the, the challenge with any type of fiber supplement is fiber absorb, fiber needs water. So as you eat, mm -hmm. as you increase, and this is important with, with diet, especially as you increase the fiber content in your diet, um, for example, I recommended that people should have five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables. If someone were to go do that tomorrow, some people actually may get GI upset because they're not used to that amount of fiber in their diet. Mm -hmm. And they're also not adding the amount of fluid that they need in because what happens is the, the fiber absorbs the water in your gut. And that's what helps it pass through your gut um, in a healthy way. So you have to increase the fiber in your diet as well as increase the water content. Those two really go hand in hand. So there are fiber supplements for constipation. Um, I would really recommend that someone look for the fiber in their food first and then maybe rely on the supplement. Okay, yeah, you have to use the food as, as med medicine. Um, Restorolax, is that, do you know about Restorolax? probably some type of laxative. I'm um, not sure what that name is. I'm not sure if that's over the counter or. Um, you know, Mark? Or, no. Yeah, it's, it's a commercially available laxative. Um, yeah. Again, you know, Joe's point about the problem with Restore Relax and other laxatives or other fiber supplements like Metamucil is you got to drink a lot of fluid because like he said, it, re it requires the fluid to actually give the, the, um, whether it's Metamucil, Restorolax, Restore bulk and volume so that your, your gut can move it along. Mm -hmm. Without mm -hmm. the fluid, it's, it's, yeah, you're not going to get anywhere at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and with the soy, is it, is it the, the soy itself or, the, or pesticides in the soy? Is the soy itself not? It's probably the, the, the question that I don't have an answer to. Probably no one has a real answer to. Um, mm. you know, that starts to get into the topic of, um, is a food, a lot of soy is genetically modified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, can humans, um, do well with a genetically modified diet? Um, mm -hmm. research isn't out there yet. It's really not there. Um, I don't think any of us really want to be eating foods that are 100% genetically modified. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to, I'd like to think as humans, we have some resiliency and we probably can, deal with some food that's genetically modified. 
Um, the soy crop particularly is also sprayed with lots of pesticides. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of different yeah. things about soy. I really, you know, soy is not necessarily bad, but try to find an organic um, soy and one that is um, aged and fermented. Absolutely. Okay, that's great advice. Yeah, yeah. organic, aged, and fermented. Yeah. So I'd like Thank to see you. Organic soy, so that for our sushi, right? Yeah, I mean, it, soy is not necessarily something that's bad, but particularly for people who are vegetarian, mm -hmm. um, they use more soy products than the average person. That's when I recommend you really should eat an, or, an organic soy for those mm -hmm. types of people. Okay. And there's also and like, it, sorry, the, the hormonal content in some of the, uh, the soy products as well. That's, I mean, again, it's modified. So that yeah. has its own nasty set of side effects. Mm -hmm. That's right. So particularly for women, if there's a, a hormonal fluctuation happening, um, soy is something that you might want to look at how much you're eating and then just work with your doctor and, and see if it is having an impact on your hormones. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, is, is it just along those lines, eating organic itself important? So I don't ever recommend that you have to eat 100% organic. You can maintain a very healthy diet without ever eating organic. Okay. If you have um, the money and the access to eat organic, mm -hmm. which not all of us do, mm -hmm. um, it can be extremely expensive. It can be extremely difficult to access um, a 100% organic diet. You know, the, really the advantage to organic diet that we see right now is pesticides. There's no mm -hmm. pesticides in organic food. That's the one thing we can say that organic foods do not have. So you're not adding chemicals to your body. Um, many of those chemicals, as, we, as Dr. Lawrence mentioned, disrupts your hormones. Mm -hmm. um, they, a lot of those chemicals have been associated with obesity. Um, so you may be eating healthy, but your food may be full of chemicals. Um, the Environmental Working Group puts out a, um, a list of the most chemically laden foods. It's called um, the Dirty Dozen. Mm. There, there are a dozen foods that they evaluate each year and they say this crop these 12 crops have the most chemicals so if you want to eat organic maybe look at that list and say okay i'm going to eat last year i think avocados were on it actually i'm going to purchase avocados that are organic because it's on that list right that's, that's but, but good I, advice yeah. yeah yeah but i want to i want to make a clear point that you don't have to eat organic to be a healthy individual <clears throat> I think a lot of the strawberries we get also are very late. Yeah, with pesticides. they were up there too. Yeah. Joe, I, I just had a quick question, you know, in, in this day of supply chain issues um, and where we are in British Columbia, it's, it's a crisis right now with massive flooding. But could you comment to the difference between, say, fresh versus frozen vegetables? Uh, because, you know, I think, I don't know about where you are, but uh, it's becoming more and more difficult to get fresh fruits. I mean, Canada, is, it's a yeah. problem just because of season. So um, just your thoughts on that, I'd really appreciate. Yeah, I, I think we're fortunate to have frozen foods. Um, I think they're, you know, they're great ways to stock your refrigerator full of healthy things. Um, they're pretty convenient because um, you have them right there. You don't have to go to the supermarket. Um, I, I, do, I have noticed actually in the supermarket I shop at, they're, that there used to be more organic fruits and vegetables. And as you mentioned, I think the supply chain has decreased that somewhat. So if you can find a frozen organic vegetable, that might be uh, worth your while and, and purchasing that and spending some extra mm. money there. Yeah. Um, just in general, with regard to, um, you know, organic and frozen, there are some studies that demonstrate that the nutrient content might be higher in fresh organic vegetables versus a frozen non-organic vegetable. Um, so for example, if, if, if you live close to where farms are and as they pick that fruit or that vegetable, they're typically picking it at a stage where it's um, closer to being optimal ripeness. When a fruit or vegetable is at its optimal ripeness, it's also at its optimal nutrient density. Right. A lot of times, for example, like a, a tomato is picked when it's green and the way it turns orange or red, if you will, is they place a gas on it or certain temperatures will change it. Mm. That's not the same as a vine ripe fruit. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So there are there are things to consider. Um, right. Again, it goes to if you can eat locally and obtain stuff locally. Yeah. So much healthier. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, question. What about? Um, I've got this question too because I had to take antibiotics for my thing. Um, what about? Uh, I don't know. Fermented food. And I, I'm hearing a lot about that fermented food and um, yogurt and that and those types of things. Yeah, so we already mentioned when we mentioned fermented soy. So hmm. a, a, an age of fermented soy is a, a form of a fermented food. Um, there are yogurts, both dairy and non-dairy versions. We're all familiar with the dairy versions, but there are non-dairy versions that are made either from um, cashew um, nut or cashew oil. There's um, coconut. Uh, what else is in the non-dairy as far as um, yogurt mm -hmm. goes? I think those are the main ones that most okay. people. Um, what like sauerkraut and what about things have, like that? You can have different types of sauerkrauts. Um, you can ferment really. You, technically, you can really ferment any vegetable. You can ferment um, carrots. You can ferment cabbage, which is typically your sauerkraut. You can even ferment ginger. So there's lots and of different types of fermented foods. You can find them in the store. They're typically mm -hmm. in the uh, refrigerator section. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need a whole lot in your diet. About a, okay. te a teaspoon or two a day really? is, all, is all you really need. Okay. Just to yep. keep that gut health, the flora uh, balance or the microbiome. Okay. Only a teaspoon a day. Okay. Well, that's better because I've been trying to eat a lot. Teaspoon or two. Or two. Or two. Okay. Yeah. Is, is honey okay as a sweetener? Does that count as sugar? Honey is sugar. Honey so is sugar. It, it, it breaks down to, you know, the basic forms of, of glucose in your body, basically. Um, honey is a form of sugar. I, re I recommend stevia before. Um, mm. there's, some, there's some good research behind stevia because it doesn't raise blood sugar um, or doesn't raise blood sugar as rapidly or fast, which is really important for a lot of people. Okay. Okay. I'm aware of all the questions coming in here and how much uh, time you have tonight. We will not go past 7.30 our time. Is that okay? Sure, we're good. We've got about 10, 10 minutes, nine minutes. Um, do you, this, is, this is a question that's come up before around uh, um, more fiber causes the bloating, even if drinking a lot of water. Do you have any suggestions for that bloating diet-wise? I have lots of suggestions. Um, we've talked about water so far. Um, your gut health overall. Um, if transit time is a, is a challenge for some people, which is, for a lot of people it can be, um, a little bit of, uh, um, so a, a little bit of um, aloe oil or aloe juice mm. is a nice way to help increase your transit time in a way that's healthy. Okay. I think there was a question about yeah, aloe. sorry, yeah, there, there was, was a question about aloe that, juice back there. That's really useful. Thank you, Joe. That that touches on that one. It, it has a laxative effect. So I usually tell people to so take an eight ounce glass and maybe about two ounces of aloe um, juice. It, it's very bitter. Um, mix it with water um, or maybe something else that you'd like to drink it with, um, and then try it. But it does help with um, transit time. It's also, okay. allergies are also wonderful for healing your gut. So if you have any kind of um, gut health challenge, it's very good for that. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. Nicole I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm also going to um, point to physical activity with regard to gut transit time and constipation. Um, if you're having challenges with constipation, particularly increasing your physical activity is a wonderful way um, for, to increase your transit time. Right. Yeah, that make that makes sense too to move your body. Yeah. Um, for people who have fibromyalgia and have a difficult time absorbing vitamins, um, should they take sublingual whenever possible? Sublingual is um, that is that vitamins, uh, Nicole? Or I'll, maybe we'll swing back to that. Let me see that. Um, some, some vitamins come in sublingual form, not all of them though. Yeah. I, I don't know, like in terms of absorption, it's yeah. a little, I mean, yeah, how much, how much can you really keep under your tongue before it tastes disgusting, right? Yeah. 
-hmm. Okay, we're getting through these. Uh, some great questions. Um, <laughs> this is a <laughs> Stuart says so cereal is no good. Is that right? <laughs> Not necessarily. Um, first of all, oatmeal really is like the original cereal. And yes. oatmeal, is, oatmeal is wonderful. Um, you know, oatmeal in the morning with some blueberries and strawberries, a little bit mm. of cinnamon on it um, is, a, is a wonderful breakfast for many different reasons, not only for um, your gut health, but even for things like regulating um, blood lipids. Um, so it's really wonderful. Look, you can have, you know, people shy away from cereal because it is a processed food. Obviously, if you're going to go to the store and you're going to purchase a cereal, you have to look at the label and you have to look at the added sugar content because most mm -hmm. of the cereals out there have a tremendous amount of added sugar content. That's yeah. the problem. You're really just eating sugar in the morning. Um, you know, finding cereals that are more toward the whole grain um, is where you want to go. Low in sugar, more toward whole grain. Yeah, yeah. And there still are a few left like that. <laughs> there are, they're out there. And just realize like in the morning, if you have, you know, a cup, you know, a couple of days where you have cereal, a couple of days where you have some eggs, a um, couple of days where you have some oatmeal, you mix it up and you have variety in your diet in the morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe like two more questions I've got here. Um, uh, Janelle's asking, what about sugar alcohols like erythritol? Erythritol? Yeah, erythritol is one. You can you can try it. Um, a lot of people complain of GI upset, particularly gas and bloating with erythritol. Um, okay. Erythritol is found in a lot of food products. It's, it's used as a sugar. Um, you can actually buy it as well and add it to things. Um, it does cause a lot of gas and bloating for people though. Okay, all right, thank you. And um, maybe one last question and then I have a question to end with. Um, uh, Lori just asked, how, how do you figure out what vitamin, uh, what vitamins all the meds that I take deplete? So if you have medications that deplete vitamins, how do you know? So your physician can run tests and check your uh, vitamins and minerals, basically. Okay, um, you can do lots, that. You lots of different out. types. Yeah, yeah. All and, right. You know, if, if, and I don't know if this is, if people here are all of our, your patients directly or not, but if you're not part of the, um, the group here is always ask your physician to run a full you know, vitamin and mineral panel for you. Sometimes they may miss things. They overlook mm. it. Vitamin D is a big one. Um, so just ask for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's actually very true, especially in Canada. The, the incidence of vitamin D deficiency north of the 49th parallel is, is significant. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I think some of us have just recommended to most of our patients to take a vitamin D supplement yeah. because um, even the same guidelines don't apply that they apply to the rest of the world because we don't make enough during the summer here anyway. Yeah, and how many how many IU's of vitamin D are you recommending to people? So the Canadian guidelines are something like four eight hundred. I'm like a thousand at least. You know, um, especially in the winter. Like you can even go to two thousand IU in the winter. Yeah, um, it's you know, um, I, I think the the current guidelines are four to eight hundred are for, for especially the further north you go are somewhat underdosing. I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? It's interesting that, you know, the research is really all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. The American Society of Endocrinology has a paper, I'll, I, can, I can find it for you. And they recommend for some people upwards of 8,000 IU. Yeah. So that, wow. that's, that's high, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's probably somewhere between two and 5,000 for most people. Right. Okay. And of course that has, that has to be checked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for, mm -hmm. you know, my clients, I recommend checking it twice a year and, right. you know, look, if it's summer and you're, you know, outside a lot, things are going to change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mark, do they do, um, vitamin mineral tests here? So you know vitamin, vitamin D, yeah, it's a special motivation some of the time. Um, okay. with the Canadian healthcare system, we've got to be, I mean, it, it, it is, it, it's limiting. D is easy to check. Um, but you know, uh, often what physicians will do as a general guideline is, you know, supplements like um, a, a, a B complex, like a B50 or B100, a zinc, vitamin D, mm. slow release vitamin C um, are pretty safe and, and are often mm -hmm. prescribed by many practitioners, myself included. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Uh, and I think, especially in people, uh, you know, it's like over 50 or so. So, you know, because I know it costs a lot of money to get some of those tests in Canada. Yeah. And right. With a, with a more socialized healthcare system, it, there, there is a cost factor involved. Yeah. Okay. People can get a check privately as well, though. Thanks. Okay. I have a question, um, to, and then we will let you go for the night since it's 10, 1030 in New York. <laughs> Uh, or maybe New York, New York is just waking up at 1030. <laughs> <I think laughs> we I'm go just to sleep. I'm just waking up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about antibiotics, and I know a lot of us had an, you know, rounds of antibiotics throughout our, our lives. How long can the gut, the gut flora, the gut microbiome, how long does it actually take after a round of an antibiotics to get back to healthy? Do you know? Because somebody some, just told me six months. I... There's some research that if someone is on a, a broad spectrum antibiotic for a long period of time, that there are colonies of gut bacteria that might not ever come back. Mm. Um, and, you know, we see that in a number of different places. I mean, if, you, if you've ever worked in a hospital um, and you see different types of, um, you know, antibiotic resistant um, bacteria. A lot of that is because things are happening in your gut as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I really think we're probably moving to a place where we realize antibiotics are important, right? They're important mm -hmm. for certain conditions and for certain health conditions. Um, they probably need to be balanced with probiotics as you're mm -hmm. taking them. Um, mm -hmm. Usually if there's a three to four hour window, most of the physicians that I've spoke with, usually a three to four hour window, between the antibiotic, you can place a probiotic in between that mm -hmm. to help maintain some type of gut health. Um, again, all of this you should check with your physician. And then it just depends on, you know, ultimately what kind of antibiotic was recommended, how long, mm. um, what's your gut health and what's your diet like going into that. Um, right. Lots of different factors too. Yeah. Probably 60% of, of what you have in your gut is probably stable. The other 40% is probably modifiable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's room there. There's room for, um, there's room for improvement. There's room for optimizing that. Mm -hmm. um, and we're learning more and more every day about different types of um, organisms in our gut. Um, you know, some physicians are saying, yes, we can prescribe single strain um, probiotics. Personally, I don't think we're quite there just yet, um, but I think we're probably moving there. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's probably a really uh, good place to, um, to wrap up tonight. Um, thank goodness we're being recorded because there was a lot of, that was a jam packed, if full Absolutely. of information to go back to and look over again. I know I'm going to have to definitely um, yeah, so Dr. Joe Tata, I really want to thank you for your slideshow and um, everything that you covered and just the, what's standing out for me is just the, the potential here to mm -hmm. heal ourselves through um, food as medicine and uh, particularly our gut health. And, you know, I'm all about the ve vagus nerve, but now I'm going to have to learn <laughs> about the nutritional side of it mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to support ourselves um, with uh, what our bodies go through, living with chronic pain um, and the stress that goes along with that, that uh, there's a lot of um, great opportunity right here through nutrition. So um, thanks, thanks again. And uh, yeah, I want to show the book Radical Relief. It's not about nutrition. The other one was, which I wrote in the uh, chat. And it was called, can you tell me again, please? Yes. Heal Your Pain Now. Okay. Heal Your Pain Now. Yeah. And it's, um, and if you look up Dr. Joe Tata at the Integrative uh, Pain Institute, and um, check out his website. And also, I don't want people to leave here without knowing about the Healing Pain podcast, because there's so many good gems in there that um, I find all the time. So thank you once again, and um, appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, Joe. It, uh, it was jam-packed. Excellent. Really, really appreciate it. Very well put together. Thanks. So it was great to be here chat with you all. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you All very right. much. You have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Good Thanks. night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.